Our next speaker is uh, Lorenzo Rosasco. So Lorenzo is uh, assistant professor at the University of Genova, and he's uh, also affiliated with uh, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where he's a uh, visiting uh, professor. Uh, his main area of research is uh, machine learning, and um, he's, he's worked on, on several things in machine learning, but he's worked quite a bit on um, kernel methods in connection with functional analysis, and um, um, I think today he's going to tell us about uh, online, uh, sorry, about uh, early stopping. So first of all, thanks, Guillaume and the other organizers for having me here. Um, I'm going to try to be reasonably quick in the interest of having lunch. Um, I'm basically going to try to convince a bit that if there is any need, that early stopping regularization is actually a very good idea for all kinds of reasons and see exactly what we know about it by now and what we don't know about it. Maybe now you can hear me. Um, Okay, so some, just some quick remarks. I mean, I think that the basic idea why we're standing here today, because in the last few years we've seen kind of a bit of a revolution both in the development of intelligent systems and generic tools to analyze complex high-dimensional data. A, because we have a lot of data that we didn't have before. B, because we have computers. And perhaps we're standing here because we have machine learning tools that can uh, allow us to actually make good use of these computational and new data resources. And so it's somewhat is in this scenario, as exactly as Guillaume saying, that one can look and see basically what's, uh, what's needed to face uh, this kind of new high dimensional scenario. I have a very basic example, and uh, I'm trying just to, as Guillaume asked me, the first few slides, the first few part of my presentation, try to be friendly. So here is just one simple example so that we all have in mind one kind of application. It's related to images exactly like what Jan has been talking about for a while. And this is just to make a point. So this is just this, the classical system that we have in all our iPhones that could put a little bounding box around a face if there is any. And the basic idea here is that each image here, I th think of it as more of a black and white image, can be seen as a collection of numbers. This number can be unrolled into a vector. Same thing for another image where there is not a face. Then you have a tag for each image, plus one or minus one, and you can stack all these images in their vector form into this big matrix. The basic point of this matrix is that, as Jan mentioned, is that there are many situations where you might have millions of images, and you will actually represent it with thousands or hundreds of thousands of features, numbers, okay? So this is kind of a, a new statistical scenario that receives a lot of attention, this kind of scenario where P is huge, and sometimes N is huge too. And now you have to handle these kind of situations. And this poses new questions. And by no means this is as, you know, specific to faces. Of course, there are a lot of other images, but also non computer vision problem where you have exactly these kind of situations. So one very basic idea that I want to contrast in this setting is the fact that when you have data, despite there are many, they might be noisy and incomplete. And so you have somewhat trade off the complexity of your model with the capability of generalized to new examples. Okay, so this is a classical case. I don't know if you can see. Here there is a very, the game here is that I have, uh, say, faces and non-faces. I just want to put the line so that I divide the space in two. Here there is this green line. It's very simple. It doesn't look too great. Here I actually make a curve going all wiggly around. This is actually perfect. It makes no mistakes on my example over here. But I can actually argue that maybe I particularize myself a bit more. I follow any particularity in my one data set. And if I actually get new points, like the triangle points, maybe I'm actually going to uh, make mistakes. Or you know, anything that goes around here, I'm actually going to make mistakes. And perhaps if I have something like this, which is complicated but not too complicated, that would be a good idea. Okay. In this, simple, in this simple sketch, where the key is that I don't care as much as the data I have now, as much as making prediction to new data, this is basically the key idea that in some sense you have to be stable with respect to the data at hand in order to allow to have generalization to new data. Okay? And this is as, whole, is as old as it gets. I don't know if you can see, there is a bias written over here. Variance is this idea that in some sense you want to have a model which is powerful but not too powerful. And this trade-off is like intrinsic in the way we model uh, modern, we, we develop modern machine learning schemes and in fact even classical statistical schemes. So what's new here? Well perhaps the part which is new on 
more, it was there already, but it's kind of emphasized in this kind of high dimensional uh, scenario is computations, okay? Oftentimes now we have to work on a budget. You know, the data might not fit memory, the data might be too much to process ways that we were used to until a few years ago. And so, a, a cute and key idea here is that to some extent, instead of just having computational resources, depending on just the rough amount of data you have, you actually would like to move, and instead of saying more data, more computation, you would like to kind of look at an effective amount of information contained in your data. So you should actually process the data more if they do contain more useful information, not just if the num rough number of data increase, okay? So the idea, in some sense, there are new trade-offs appearing where not only you have bias and variance, but also this idea of computation. All, boom. All these concepts should, uh, should balance each other, okay? Um, what do I mean by that? Well, there are a couple of, there is a paper that was mentioned before. I'm sorry I misspelled this name. This is because of last minute uh, uh, grav induced uh, slides. Um, Bousquet, uh, Boutou kind of emphasized this one point. I think Martin Weir at Berkeley has been kind of advertising this idea that you have to look both at statistical computation and in a, in a, like a unifying picture. If you want, what I'm going to present today is kind of a vignette, it's kind of a simplified situation where hopefully all this blah blah, you know, can be instant in something that people all agree and understand. So this is kind of my goal today. So in view of for coming lunch, this is going to be my menu of the day. So the first part, I'm really going to go through a relatively basic, I apologize if it's too, it's too simple, review of uh, least squares, okay? Learning with least squares, regularized least squares. And then I move on to tell you why one should look at early stopping. And if time allow, and I hope so, tell you something about uh, um, how you go from gradient descent like idea to stochastic gradient descent and whether you should do it, okay? Stochastic gradient, as you mentioned several times, I'd like to discuss that a little bit. Little bit. Okay, so um, I, this, I stole this from a class that I recently gave, so I was looking a bit, so Wiley squares, well, I just stick to uh, Legendre, 200 years ago, basically said that it's the most natural thing you can do. Okay, we, of course, we, this is half a joke, you can argue it quite a bit. Uh, fun trivia is that it turns out that apparently, I always thought it was Gauss, then here it says Legendre, apparently five years later Gauss published a paper where he said that he actually thought about it 15 years before, okay? And so apparently now you can read the articles where they're kind of, uh, I, think I'm, I think Gauss might be winning, but for sake of, uh, and we stick to Legendre for now. So I'm basically, I, I wanna look at this stuff and I'm gonna tell you a bit about why I wanna look at it, but not quite, I'm actually gonna stick to another guy and uh, in fact quite a few, namely we're gonna look at penalization of this objective term by a term. Okay, and there are tons of reasons why you want to do this, and I'm going to explain at least one in a second. Here again, there is a fun trivia name, maybe, which is, this is usually called Tikhonov. And in fact, Tikhonov is probably the only guy you can find a picture online. Turns out that maybe he did it in 43, in some Russian paper that I could not retrieve. It's certainly true that in 61 or 62, something happened, and everybody, a bunch of people, not everybody, but a bunch of people got the same idea. And also this gives you a bit of a name game, because this thing is now known. If you, I guess if you do linear system and so on, uh, as Tikhonov regularization in statistics is actually called ridge regression, and it's just a form of linear filtering if you actually look at signal processing. So I'm talking about that thing, okay, however you want to call it. Um, so how does it work? It's basically an instance of like restoring well-posedness. So you got this problem. I just rewrote the one I had before in vector notation, okay? Now you optimize, you just perturb the problem this way, and now you have a, a window of um, interpretation by looking at actual computations, okay? So this is very basic. If you do this, you just set the derivatives equal to the gradient equal to zero, and then you just have to solve this linear system. And as you can see here, you have to invert a matrix. And in general, this may be not possible, or even when it's possible, maybe ill conditioned, meaning that if you change the data a bit, this thing is going to change a lot. And so you lose the capability of generalizing to new points. So all we're doing here is adding a term on the diagonal of this matrix. So what happens is that if an eigenvalue is small, when you try to invert the matrix, this is actually going to not cost you much because now you have lambda, okay? And of course your lambda tells you exactly how you go, <laughs> boom, fitting, I'm sorry, I'm Italian, sorry with these things. Between uh, um, fitting your data or, um, between fitting your data or between achieving stability, okay? 
So I, I'm not here to teach you this. I'm just putting, I want to put it up there just because I'm assuming that at least at some point of your life somebody bother you with this and I want to use this, okay? So I actually want to make two quick side comments, kind of stuff that I want to say but I don't want to say too much. The first thing, I'm going to stick throughout my talk to linear models. Why? Well, clearly I don't want to stick to linear model, okay? I want to look at nonlinear stuff. But to some extent, I'm looking at the very last teeny bit layer that uh, uh, you know, Jan discussed in his uh, long pipeline. So I assume that basically somebody fixed the problem of picking features for me, okay? So I'm going to be very lazy. And perhaps picking the feature is actually the biggest part, but I want to stick to this part right now. And so I'm going to think, if you want, somebody actually, if you want everywhere you, where you see an X, imagine that somebody, without telling you, actually took your original X and mapped it with some new features, okay? So whenever you see an X, there should be an X tilde, which is actually a mapped feature map. So everything I said is going to work in this map-induced space. This is the classical point of view. This is just one example where you go basically from uh, um, linear function to polynomial function by first embedding the data through some kind of polynomial embedding. And I think, you know, Nicola mentioned uh, the polynomial kernel. That's kind of exactly what you're doing, okay? You can do it by hand. You can have algorithm do it. I don't care. Somebody did it for me. And all I want to do now is stick to this kind of linear model with perhaps no linearity hidden in my variables, okay? So this basically I don't want to discuss. The thing that I want to set quickly because uh, uh, to prevent uh, an obvious question is why least square for classification? That's kind of an obvious algorithm for regression. Why do you want to do it in classification? There are tons of reasons why you might want to do it. Here I give you one that I didn't know and I kind of like it. If you look at this X transpose Y, okay, forget about a few normalization here and there. This is actually just the difference between the mean of class one and the mean of class minus one. Just because the Y vector is either one or minus one. Okay, that's what you get. And so if you have two classes, this is the mean of class one and this is mean of class minus one. If you look at this thing here, exactly what least squares is doing, what you can do is basically you know, checking out that what he's doing is some kind of warped version of the simplest nearest mean, okay? So what is nearest mean? You get two classes, you compute the means, and when you get to a new point, you check which mean is closest. And then you say, okay, this is the class of this point. This is this algorithm here, okay? This version here has a matrix in between that is doing something. What is it doing? Well, what's doing is basically that aside from this first order of information containing the means, it actually looks at some kind of second order information so that while this nearest mean algorithm is going to give you the same solution in this situation or in this situation where the means are the same, if now you have two cloud of points that rotate a bit, the means remain the same, now this other method is going to be sensitive to this, okay? And it's going to give you uh, uh, a more effective solution. And again, this is a, I don't want to make a big fuss. This is just, you know, one glimpse of why it makes sense to use least squares, even if you're looking at classification problem. The other thing, just implement it to try and see how much, how worse they behave. And you should be surprised how, work, how well they usually work. All right, so, um, but let's go a bit more into the business of the story. How do you choose lambda? Okay, and here I'm going to take a half between a practical point of view and a theoretical point of view. Um, I give up to cross validation. Okay, I'm not going to do anything smarter than that. I'm going to split my data in half or in some percentage. I'm going to do half for training whatever is my model and the other half to actually tune the parameter lambda. Why? Is this a good idea? No, but it's like what I know how to do and if I go and ask my friends who solve problem in practice, I think that's what no, 95% of my friends would do. Okay, so and it's not that the other five are not my friends, but uh, that's majority. So what I want to do is look at this, and I want to look a second at complexity, okay? How we should count the complexity of an algorithm, and this is how I want to do it, and I would argue this is the way you should do it. You should tell me how much it costs me to train whatever I need to train to compute the whole, you know, the cross-validation error, okay? And this is what sometimes you call regularization path. So if you fix lambda in this guy here, you can solve it in a bunch of ways, but essentially the cost you have is linear in n, and then you have p square. I'm assuming here that n is bigger than p, okay? But then you have still to multiply by the number of parameters you have to look at, okay? If you don't give me that number, I don't care because that's exactly what I have to run on my, on my laptop or whatever is my machine. Then you also have to tell me the price you pay to actually compute the best possible parameters, and this you can check that is, in most cases, actually negligible, okay? That's not a big deal. So this is the complexity I want to look at. The joint complexity of training a model for several values of the parameter lambda, because then I have to use cross-validation to choose it, okay? 
So this is what I want to do, and what I would argue is actually a reasonable way to tell me what's the complexity of the algorithm. If you just give me this part, well, I don't know. I then have to, have to check how much it costs me to compute the whole regularization path. So you leave it to me. So this is exactly what you get with Tikhonov, okay? With Tikhonov, you've got this complexity times the number of parameters you have to look at. So can we do better than this? And this is what brings us to the other, uh, the second part of my talk. So, uh, and this also tells you why I bother you with looking a bit into this. So what is Tikhonov doing? He's basically saying, I want to invert the matrix, but not quite, because this matrix inversion might not be a well-behaved operation. So let me throw away a few small eigenvalues and get an approximate inverse. Okay, so here I want to show you a slightly different way of doing this, and the way I want to do it is just remind you if, so, I mean, we all remember from uh, the back of our memory that, you know, the geometric series, just if these are numbers, tells us that C to the minus one, this is a number, can be written in this way, okay? You probably, if you don't remember the first thing, you probably all have seen it in high school at some point in your life. So how about we actually, instead of taking a full, so we can write the inverse of a number as a power expansion with an infinite series. But how about we stop the series to some value t? Of course, we are not writing that exactly. This is just an approximation, okay? So this is exactly what I want to do. So luckily, uh, Neumann told me that I can actually do this instead of with numbers, with matrices, okay? At least with the nice matrices I'm dealing with. So I'm gonna replace C by the matrix I want to try to invert, okay? And then, so this would be exact. This is my truncation. Okay? Notice that in the meanwhile, I attached a little number gamma here. You know, any guess why? Well, this whole story works if C is smaller than one, okay? Otherwise, it doesn't converge. So here, this gamma is actually a fixed parameter that I need to put smaller than one in order for this series to converge, okay? So this is my little two minutes technical stuff, but this is my proposal for an algorithm, okay? Just use this truncated series and just use this thing, okay? So by now, you should be convinced that this is a legitimate thing to do because I want to try to get an approximate inverse, okay? And here I'm doing exactly that, okay? You should also be kind of a bit worried and you should tell me if I'm crazy because now I'm telling you that I want to take all these matrices and I want to take their powers many times, okay? And this looks totally insane from a computational point of view. But it's actually a classical fact that you don't need to do that to compute that solution. This is actually what you get after t iteration of an iterative procedure, which is right here. Okay, you start from zero, and then you have to add to the vector this stuff here. Gamma is now this parameter that is fixed once and for all to have this x transpose x smaller than one. And then you just have to run this. If you do t iteration, you can prove by induction, as a three lines prove, that this thing at step t minus one is exactly this. Okay, so it's actually like Tikhonov, okay, but you can implement it this way. And this gives you a slightly different point of view. If you look at, if you stare at this a little bit, you can recognize in this essentially the gradient of the squared error, okay, of the least squares. So what you're saying now is, I'm gonna just not penalize my least squares, I'm just gonna optimize it, but I'm gonna stop my iteration. The only free parameter I have right now is the number of iterations. The step size is fixed once and for all, okay? So by no means any of what I say is my work, but this is like classical, I guess, from you know, work from the 50s, Van Weber in inverse problem, but it's really a one perspective of gradient descent, which is exactly this algorithm, and this is just one way to start from stability and Tikhonov kind of to make a connection, okay? Right, so now you look at this and you see that actually the, the uh, computation is actually improved with respect to before. I'll get back to that in a second. Let me just look one second. Can you see anything? So there are points over there, okay? And it's something like a cosine or sine, which is my regression function, so I'm to plan the regression. This is x, this is y. There is some function. I just want to look uh, at the fit of these points. I'm going to start from zero. And this is my cheap version of a movie that I know how to do. So this is gonna be the flat solution I have at the beginning. Then if I let it go enough, now I don't really know if you see it, but there is a curve that goes all up and down, okay? So I'm fitting, okay? I'm getting a lot of my data. But if I stop somewhere in between, then you do get a good approximation, okay? And that's basically the basic idea in early stopping. Stopping the iteration as a regularizing effect. And if you want the argument I showed you before, gives you a bit of a you know, proof of why this should be the case. 
Notice that you have to make, uh, so this is my terrible plot that I had at the very last minute. The point I'm making is that the error on your data, the one you have today, is clearly going to go down all the time. But if you look at future data, you're going to have what is called the semi-convergence effect. The error goes down up to a point and then it goes up. Okay? So generalization our goal and then you do have an optimal iteration. Okay? Um, so again, this idea is by no means new. Okay? People use these uh, in inverse problems and uh, it's, a, uh, it's a trick that you use to train neural networks quite a bit since uh, years. Um, the cool thing I find here is that that's what I said, I give you an instance of this idea that com there is an interplay between computations and uh, uh, statistics and generalization. Okay? This is exactly what is going on. Controlling the amount of computation, controlling optimization gives you stability both numerically and statistically. So it does give you generalization. And so I think it's kind of nice because here you don't really have a trade-off between three quantities, but you have only one quantity, computation, controlling the trade-off between bias and variance. Okay? So this is a kind of a, a cute vignette of the general idea of using computation in order to get better algorithms. Um, what about, this is, this is the simple gradient descent. So the first thing you can ask me is, can you do it in other ways? Yes. The main thing that we did in the last few years was not inventing the wheel because it was already there, but I was actually trying to, and at some point we were asking ourselves, why nobody, you know, why don't not everybody use this? This is so cute. You'll see in a second what you say from a computational point of view. And so we tried to prove, you know, the fanciest statistical learning bounds we could to actually prove that it was as good as Tikhonov. And we did it for the gradient descent. The first people that looked at this were Bin Yu and Peter Buman in 02. We look at this, um, this is actually much earlier, it's like 05. Then we moved on and look at the accelerated gradient, so accelerated version of this. And then we want, you know, uh, Gilles Blanchard and Nicole Kramer look at conjugate gradient. So for all these methods, Long story short, you can ask, do they work in practice, okay? And these are my, are my, my crappy old simulations, but again, it's a, it's a classical trick used in neural networks all the time. Our analysis doesn't exactly uh, apply to that right away because we're looking at convex problems, whereas here you have to look at much more complicated non-convex problems. More recently, kind of exactly the algorithm I told you was applied to kind of scale up kernel methods together with other tricks to get some good results on big data sets, okay? And we're there basically, they didn't want to use early stopping, but it turns out it was the most practical thing to do, and so they stick to it. Um, now, how about proofs, okay? You have to make some assumption here, I wanna skip it, but the basic story is, if you want to try to get to learning rates, okay, and I have a couple of slides, but in the interest of time, I'm just gonna fly through them, you have to make some assumption, these assumptions are related to basically betting on what your strategy. So we are throwing away small eigenvalues, okay? If there are a lot of small eigenvalues, that's okay, okay? And if my function can be written nicely on the big eigenvalues, it's okay. So I have these two parameters. How many, what is the effective dimension of my data? How many big eigenvalues I have? And the other thing is, can I write my function nicely on those big eigenvalues, okay? And so basically you can get rates that depend on these two parameters, okay? And people know minimax rate, optimal rates, and all the algorithm I told you so far do get these optimal rates as much as a Stikhanov, okay? So all these algorithms from a statistical point of view are just the same. And here is the scary version of that. Um, just in case you are disappointed with the lack of details. So, um, but this is kind of the cool part. If you look at all those algorithms, instead of having NP square complexity times the number of uh, lambda you have to try, now lambda is the number of iteration. So the complexity is now is NP times the number of iteration. So we went, we took one P down, okay? And this can be slightly improved for the accelerated gradient. Instead of square root, uh, number of lambda, you get actually square root of lambda, okay? So while from a statistical point of view, there's nothing to gain of moving away from Tikhonov, you can actually try to get something for a computational point of view, okay? And so this is somewhat uh, uh, the story. So since I have five minutes, I imagine I have two now. So let me just glance, uh, or half, I don't know, but let me just glance through this quickly, okay? The next thing I did is, uh, as Nicolas said that the most people say that stochastic gradient works better than the full gradient, actually that's the same thing I heard. So, okay, let's move to that. And I said, okay, this is the full gradient, okay? Let's move to the stochastic gradient. In the stochastic gradient, the whole matrix is actually replaced by just one point, okay? And then you 
in principle, you can do only n steps because you have n points. The good thing about this is the cost of the iteration here is not np, but it's just uh, p, okay? And then you have to do n iteration. Does this work? Well, not quite, okay? You, this algorithm, at least if you fix this to be a universal constant, doesn't have any way. It works as well as minimizing the least squares. It doesn't have any way to control fit versus uh, stability, okay? So people look at a bunch of ways on fixing it. The most classical one is doing averaging, okay? So-called polyac averaging. One other thing is to either add a little penalty here or projecting, okay? Projecting in some balls and then try to relax this. A slightly more interesting thing is actually choose smartly the, uh, the step size and still, and notice that, sorry, in all this algorithm, you're looking at the data in principle only once. So this is great because your algorithm is really NP, okay, for fixed parameter. And you can choose this, uh, uh, this step size carefully, but actually, I don't know about Nicola, but all my friends, actually what they do is that they don't do this, okay? What they do is that they look at data once and then they start, and oftentimes they look at data more than once. And so what I wanted to know is, what are they doing, okay? I just studied early stopping a few years before. Can I show that he's actually doing early stopping? So the name of the game is going to be, I don't want to do polyac averaging. I want to fix here a step size which just doesn't depend on the distribution. It's some says fixed a priori. And my only free parameter will be essentially do the iteration of n minus 1 and then do it again and then do it again. So there is an inner iteration of n steps and an outer iteration which is on a number of iteration that is the number of epochs. Okay? Now, it turns out, again, that you can actually look at the different proofs. That's what we've been doing recently. The, the landscape of results is a bit more spotty, okay? We don't have a clear picture under most general assumption. Uh, Francis has some recent results for the averaging with fixed universal step size in finite dimension. Uh, there are other results for the penalized situation with the, uh, the varying step size situation. And then there are we recently did this multiple epoch situation, okay? And in all this, you have to think what is your regularization parameter, okay? Because then you have to tell me what is your computation. In this case, you have lambda, okay? So you're gonna run this, and you're gonna run it as many times for as many lambda you have, because then you have to choose it. Here, you're gonna run the algorithm just for n step, but for many different gamma, okay? Here, you actually run the algorithm as many times as you fix the number of epochs. So these are my three regularization parameters. And so in some sense, I'm back to exactly to this complexity here for all of them. So the same as gradient descent, just the same as gradient descent. Because I have to run, even if you just do n steps, you have to run as many times as are your regularization parameter. Okay? And the take home message here is that in some sense you can move from full gradient to this stochastic gradient. And what the question out there is, is there a substantial gain from a computational point of view, from a statistical point of view? And this is by no means an empirical evaluation, but it's more of a, like a mathematical evaluation, okay? Um, so there are a bunch of, uh, let me just conclude quickly. So what we wanted to try to do here is, let's try to ground early stopping theoretically so that we can check, you know, you know try to advertise and see what are the bottlenecks of this method. It looks very cute, okay? And, uh, um, I think this is, for me, is the general idea, is an instance of the general idea that computations, approximate computation, are actually coinciding with regularization a lot of time, and not forgetting about this could be an important principle in designing algorithms. And there are this, everything I said here readily generalized to multitask and so on. Um, so looking ahead, as I said, there, are, there is the rates gain we have to improve. You know, uh, score root here, uh, one over n there. So this is gonna be mostly technical. Slightly more conceptual, you can say, Right, okay, you love the least squares, I don't. Can you do the same stuff with other laws? And that's what we start doing with Ding Xuan Zhou in Hong Kong, and it seems that you can get in right rates, it's much harder. A much cooler question is, I don't like L2 regularization. I don't like Tikhonov to begin with. I like sparsity, because everybody likes it. So can I do sparsity with this kind of stuff? I don't know, okay? Uh, we did, you know, in some simulation, it seems you can, it's much harder. Everything is much harder. In some sense, the unitary invariant you have for L2, it's, it's a blessing here. So we're working on that. So my, my current uh, status is optimistic, but I don't know. The last thing, which, you know, this is kind of an increasing, and this would do, to go in the really most interesting situation, is what about non-convex problems? There my answer is just, I don't know. But people use it, and so it's more of, a, of the question of proving it rather than just uh, showing that it can work. 
So that's it. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, let's take uh, a few minutes to answer a few questions before we go for lunch. Or let's go to lunch. And yeah, actually, uh, this is more a comment. Uh, in uh, the early methods used in uh, image processing, I think of the works by the team of Morel, or if you look at the early methods which were used for uh, image reconstruction, Actually, these early uh, stopping methods were very used. Yeah. And finally, all the people decided to stop to use them because you have two main drawbacks. You have first that you don't know how to stop, basically. And there is another problem, which is that it is strongly dependent on the initialization of your algorithm. So basically, maybe it has some uh, uh, yeah. I interest in machine learning, but for the domain of inverse problem where I'm working in, it is not considered at this time as a very good research direction. Right, so let me comment on that and then we check. Okay, so one of these initialization, the other one is the stopping. The stopping, you know, blame it on cross-validation, okay? But you will, if you replace early stop with something else, I can ask you the same question, whatever algorithm you replace it with. So Tikhonov, how do you choose lambda? But then they will, let's not use Tikhonov because we don't know how to choose lambda. So that's a strong argument, but it's an argument like about all regularization method with a free parameter you have to choose. So here I just tell you use cross-validation, okay? So it's not a problem of early stopping. If it doesn't work, it's a problem of cross-validation. So, or, you know, if you want to do models of principle or any other thing. If the problem is there, it's not in the early stopping method. About the other problem, well, again, it, it depends a bit what kind of inverse problem you're looking at. If you're just looking at the linear inverse problem in, the, you know, in this kind of quadratic case and the regular more penrose solution, this is a convex problem. So the zero solution is as good as, the zero, zero initialization is as good as it gets. It gets you right to the more penrose solution. So if you look at non-convex problems, okay, it's a whole different story. So I think the main point I want to make here is that I think that oftentimes at the very last piece of when you have to do classification, you actually do use stuff like Tikhonov regularization or SVM, which is the big brother of, uh, of Tikhonov regularization. Oh, and that's exactly the situation where you are, convex. And so initialization won't matter. And an inverse problem is the same as long as you just solve, you know, usually a linear inverse problem with quadratic norm and the quadratic penalty. So I, I guess it depends a bit. Uh, I'm, I'm sure. I mean, I'm not saying that this is like the winner takes all. I just, you know, for all those kind of problems, it should work. I mean, I imagine, I mean, I'm very happy to see what kind of situation where it doesn't, and I think it will fall in some of the future work, probably. All right, let's take another question. Uh, got a, another question. I was uh, wondering if you are expecting to go below uh, NP uh, number of uh, uh, lambda, I mean, number of iterations. Do, do you think that you can actually get a bound that is lower than that? I don't know. I mean, I think maybe yes. So to some extent, people do that right now. They think, I don't want to, the way I would like to do it, so I think it's possible, but, the, but I don't know. And the way I would like to do it is not by playing a game where I do another approximate computation and then another approximate computation, another approximate computation. The game here is actually to reduce the number of computation to the minimum and then see how they interact with each other, both for computation and statistics, okay? So for example, I could say, I do a random projection of my data. Okay, sure. How do you choose the number of components in random projection? K. How do you choose K? I don't know. How does it interact with the early stopping or lambda or whatever you want to use it? Then I would say, why don't you just do least squares at that point? You just solve least squares. Okay, why don't you just do least squares with random projection? Because now you have a free parameter. So my answer is I don't know. And the way I'm going after it, that's what I'm trying to do, is not forget that every approximate computation potentially is regularization if it's right. Thanks for the talk, <clears throat> uh, which is great. I have a question that is, uh, amount of competition put aside, did you try to actually compare the regularization path of like using Tikhonov regularization and doing early stopping? So you basically have a sequence of one more complex models. Uh, do you actually go through about the same models so there's some kind of equivalence between A, fully optimizing for A lambda and doing early stopping, or do they actually take 
quite different path. No, it's, it's pretty much the same. You can, in fact, so one other way to show that early stop, in, so the way I did it is basically showing that it's another way to invert the matrix, but you can actually try to do a series expansion to show that, you know, that power expansion is like Tikhonova. You can do that. And at that point, you really see kind of that they are the same up to two second orders. And so this is why the regularization paths are essentially the same. So in my view, there are really essentially the same thing statistically and just different from a computational perspective. And the theorem also says that same. All right, I think it's uh, high time to go and have lunch. Let's uh, thank Lorenzo again.